Tell me when you see my screen. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, excellent. So thank you everybody for coming. Uh, as Adi said, uh, we've been using uh, coatings to implement our product for the last couple of years. Uh, we've used uh, boost code. Uh, we stopped hearing, or is it just for me? Yeah, me too. Oh, wait, I think maybe you got silence. None is frozen. It's oh. snow in Jerusalem. Reduce. <laughs> Try to cover the, 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 to move the camera. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, yes. now you're back. Okay, so we moved the camera. Hopefully that will help. Uh, the weather is uh, not kind to the internet connection here. Uh, so as I said, we've been using uh, Boost Coating 2 for a couple of years now in our product. And uh, I want to, to share with you what, uh, what the experience was, how we approach it, some of the pros and some of the cons that we've encountered uh, doing so. So the, the framework that I'm going to present is, first of all, I'm going to try and install my mental model of what a coating is and how to think about coatings in your head. So you'll see the world the way I see it. Maybe you like it, maybe you won't, but you know, it's another way to look at, to look at things. Then I'm going to uh, look a bit more about the C plus plus 20 coatings. So we can see how that mental image relates to what we see in the standard. Uh, what are the differences and what are the similarities? And then I'm going to uh, dive in and sort of uh, give you a basic framework of what we do so you can take it and implement it yourselves if you are interested in doing so. If I convince you that there are enough benefits to doing so. So let's start by thinking about how do we understand coroutines? And it's sort of a deceptively simple question because there are two ways that I see people actually understanding coroutines. One of them is in relation to iteration. So everything has to do with iterators and generators and uh, uh, basically all the, 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 that approach that comes from, as we said, from Python and we see that C++23, as we just heard, might even increase the, the scope of that. That's one way to, to relate to coroutines. Uh, another one is to talk about concurrent processing something that has more to relate to the world of threads and how do we have more than one execution going on at the same time in some sense. And this is the world that I initially encountered coroutine with. Uh, this is one I, I feel more comfortable talking about. And initially uh, when I, was introduced to the idea that you use coatings in the relation to iteration and generators, it seemed weird for me. Uh, in the same way that if I were to tell you that threads could be used to generate information for your loops, you would say, probably yes, but it, it, it seems like a very strong tool to use for a very small uh, task. And what changed my mind was basically uh, the talk that I, I did gave, which uh, this is a kind of magic, really, I think, that we have a binary tree here and we want to uh, do an in-order traversal on it. So we want to go one, two, three, four, five, six. So every time we go to the left, we get smaller numbers. Every time we go to the right, we get a bigger number. We want to iterate over the, uh, over the whole tree and get all the values. And when you think what an iterator has to do, so we start by going all the way to the left. And the next iteration is always, if we have a, a right sun, we go to the right sun and then all the way back to the left. If we don't have a right sun, we go up. And if we went up from the uh, left sun 
then this is the next iteration. If not, we still go up another one and we need to do this, this until we, we finish. And this is complicated and I hope I said it right and I didn't make a mistake along the way. It's not a simple logic to iterate in order uh, over this tree. And then I showed this and I'm copying this shamelessly from the presentation that he gave. And, and, and this is incredible because this is a very simple recursive logic that gives you all the uh, all the information that you want in the order you want it. You want, first of all, all the things to your right because they are smaller than you yourself, then everything to the right. So this is incredible. This is the one example that I saw and I said, okay, now I'm convinced. Now I'm convinced there's actually great value in using coatings as iterators. It really simplifies things in, in, in a considerable way, something that I wouldn't be able to do uh, otherwise. And there's a, a link to uh, the talks in the YouTube channel. Go see that there's a lot more discussion there about generators and, 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 do that, and all of that. What I hope that we will be able to understand uh, later in the, in, in, the, in the talk is exactly how this code works and what are the hidden costs that, uh, that, uh, uh, that are hidden inside this code here because the magic does come with a certain price tag to it. So uh, having said that, let's uh, talk about how I, how I see coroutines and we'll start with, you know, something that you all should be familiar with, I think, a very simple process. So I have a process here, I have a, the big rectangle is sort of the memory space that it has, that contains uh, many things, uh, the code sections, globals, and so on and so forth. I'm going to simplify it and say, we have the stack and we have the heap. It's not exactly accurate, but for the sake of this uh, discussion, I think it's, it's close enough. Uh, and the stack really uh, represents the process that we're doing. So if we have a function called foo, it will appear at the start of the, st of the stack. And if we, foo calls the function bar, then bar will be in the next stack frame above foo. So far, it's very simple. And if I want, I can have another process completely separate in which the function snack call the function foo and everything works great. These two uh, processes can be on different machines. Can, they can be on the same machine. They, they are not related to one another. This is very simple. We all know that. Next, we have threads. So now we have the same memory space and two stacks in it. And really uh, thinking about uh, two processes that share the same uh, memory space is a way to understand threads. There are some differences, of course, but it's a very good mental image. You have two processes that share the threads. And again, they can both uh, progress independently the same way as they did when they were separate processes. The difference, for example, now is that they have to share the same hardware. They can't be on completely different machines because they need to share the same memory space. And threads, uh, so we know there are certain difficulties that come with working with threads. Uh, you have to manage your critical sections, you to avoid race conditions, all sorts of deadlocks. There might be a starvation. Uh, there's a threat contentions issues. Uh, for those who may not be familiar, a threat contention is a case where I have thread A that uses one int and thread B uses a second int. And those ints are not related. Uh, there is no question of interacting with one another, but unfortunately they share the same cache line. And since they share the same cache line, every time one thread access its uh, integer, it steals the cache, the cache line from the processor to uh, the other thread and the other thread can't uh, access that integer until the uh, cache line is being brought back from the other core back to the core that, that they run to. Uh, there are measurements of how bad this can be. Um, 
but uh, this, uh, this is a performance issue. It's not a logical issue. It's a performance issue that can rise when you are working with threads. And uh, another issue that happens is resource management. Uh, if you allow every part of your program that needs to do something uh, in parallel to open their own threads, you might end up with a lot of threads in the system. If you are alone on a very strong machine, that probably not going to be an issue. But if you have a weaker machine or if you share your hardware with other processes, maybe opening uh, you know, a few dozen threads might not be something that uh, would be looked kindly upon. Uh, so we have the, the, the this image of threads. And, and now I want us to, uh, to imagine that uh, we only have one core. Okay, somebody, you know, tweak the, uh, the affinity and we're only allowed to work with one core. Well, uh, okay, we, we don't have true parallel computation at this point because we have only one core and one core can only do one thing at a time. But uh, it, it should behave very much in the same way that we are familiar with from before. We have several tasks, they are executed in any way, in any form of way, uh, in any order that, uh, that may happen. And uh, they are not truly parallel because again, one core, but uh, 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 we, we, we're familiar and we're, we're comfortable with that. And now I want to freeze that mental image and talk to you about coroutines finally, and ask, well, how does this mental image changes if we are uh, working with coroutines? And the answer is, in terms of memory, it looks exactly the same. Coroutines uh, look the same way if you freeze the if you freeze the image of the processor and the memory space for an instance, you won't be able to tell if you are use if you what is running is coroutines or threads. There is no difference in terms of in terms of memory. Why? Because what's the difference between threads and coroutines? Threads are preemptive and coroutines are cooperatives. So it really all comes down when, on to the question, who decides to switch uh, stacks? Who tells the, uh, the single core that we have now execute something from stack A or now execute something on stack B? Uh, for threads, this is something that is external to the program, usually the operating system. The operating system that has a scheduler, the scheduler decides, okay, now we're going to progress uh, stack one, now we're going to uh, progress stack two. And since it's external to, uh, to the program, it happens in some random place during the execution. Coroutines, on the other hand, uh, uh, the program itself decides when the uh, switch will be made, usually to something like a yield command. And since it's done by the program, it's, it happens in a well-known uh, position in the, in the execution process. And this has several uh, interesting implica implications. Uh, the big one for me is uh, no locks. You don't need locks anymore you only switch stacks at a place that is convenient to you. You can arrange all the memory you, you want to into a stable location and say, okay, now I'm ready. Now you can take the execution back for, for, back for me to some, and give it to somebody else. You don't have to worry that somebody changes the execution and give it to somebody else in the middle of your computation and may change the memory that you're working on. Nobody is going to steal the execution from you until you release it. This is incredible. It reduces race conditions. There can still be race conditions, but there will be race conditions uh, sort of on a higher logical uh, level. If you uh, arrange your coroutines in such a way, in the task in such a way that they are, uh, uh, that they really compete logically on one another, say, uh, mm, I'll think of an example, I'll give you an example in a moment. Uh, what you don't get is race condition because uh, two uh, 
coatings are trying to access the same uh, low-level integers. If I'm currently working with an integer or working with a piece of memory, then I'm working with a piece of memory. I don't release it until, uh, until I'm done. Tom, there's a question in the chat. Would you like me to read it for you? Yes. Sure. So Alfred is asking, uh, what's the essential difference between coroutines and fibers? Um, okay, uh, good question. Uh, the answer is a bit depend on, on whom you ask, because there is no, uh, I've looked into that and I've seen several uh, definitions of exactly what counts as a coating and what exactly counts as a fiber. Uh, I, um, I'll give one example of, of, a dif of a difference that people sometimes make. Um, uh, Coatings uh, sometimes are said to include stackless and stack full, and fiber are specifically that type of coatings that are stack full. That's one definition of a fiber that there is. Uh, some people say uh, define coating as the language mechanism for what we're doing, and fiber as uh, the infrastructure that implements that logical mechanism. So there, there are a bunch of definitions and there isn't uh, that I sense uh, industry a, a wide acceptance of exactly what the each terms mean. So depends on exactly what definition of coating and fiber you choose, you will get a slightly different answer of, about what's the difference, including people who would say, uh, those are just two terms for the same thing that arose from different uh, 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 sort of traditions that sort of merged together at some point. So, so what's the difference? If there's a difference, depends on whose definition do you accept for a coating and a fiber, basically, I, think, I would say I at this point. What, if I can just add my two cents, um, usually fibers are an operating system facility service, just like threads but they're implemented differently because the context, there's no context switching. Um, and Boost does have some kind of wrapper, I forget the name, for um, fibers. Um, and but C++ coroutines are like uh, Norm said, they're totally user side language based. So, but in many ways, they, when you say stackless or stack full, it doesn't talk about things like the heap or the stack, it talks about aspects of where the stack is uh, is allocated and who allocates it where. So um, uh, it's, it, uh, we're not talking about fibers here. Uh, CPS core teams are not fibers, but on some level, there is a way to look at, at all of these things as core teams. I did just a small uh, correction. Fibers are, are a user space concept. They could be provided by the operating system Windows, for one, does that. Uh, they, they are provided by the operating system. You are supposed to implement your own scheduling, and it doesn't go into the uh, uh, kernel. No, I didn't say it's not it. user space. I said it's it's mm -hmm. totally in your. Uh, you're not using any operating system facility to do it, uh, which could be hypothetically beyond what, uh, implemented beyond what you can in your language. That, that's what I'm saying. No, you are using operating system facilities, just not kernel facilities. Yes. Okay. Okay, so um, where was, uh, I talked about uh, reduced uh, uh, race condition. So, um, so yeah, you don't have the, the same kind of race condition issues that you have uh, with fully, uh, uh, when the execution can be stolen from you uh, at, at a moment's notice. Uh, it's not entirely logically impossible to have race conditions, but it's uh, less of a problem. Uh, one other thing that you get is, uh, since you are the one who says when each uh, process will run, you can set up your own priorities in a way that is much more convenient let's say, uh, then if you are just released a thread to the world and the, then the thread starts running uh, on its own, uh, at, the, at which point the uh, operating system scheduler is the one who sets the priorities, not you in the program. Uh, 
And uh, last but not least, uh, it costs you less to switch uh, from one stack to the other. Uh, the reason being is if we think about uh, what what happens when the scheduler decides to uh, switch from one uh, stack to the other, the schedule the operating system doesn't know which uh, registers are in use, which values in the registers are already saved someplace else and don't need to be resaved. So the uh, operating system has to sort of take a snapshot of the entire situation, everything uh, in every register, save it all, uh, and restore it all back when we return. Uh, in contrast, since uh, when we are using coroutines, we know which uh, we are, we are aware on the context of the, of the execution. We know which reg registers are used, we know if we just loaded the value for memory and we don't need to save it because it's already saved someplace else. Uh, we know if this is going to be used for later on uh, or not. And it means that the cost of switching from one step to the other is much closer to uh, invoking a function rather than a uh, uh, context switch in the, in the sense of switching between threads. So that's uh, something else that we gain. Uh, what do we lose uh, if, if, if we are going to choose uh, uh, coroutines? Uh, we, we lose the external schedule. Okay, tell me when you can hear me. Uh, I can hear you fine. They didn't lose you actually. Yes, yes, we can. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so, so uh, as I said, uh, what did we lose? Uh, we lose the external scheduler. So uh, with great power comes great responsibility. I don't know where I came that. Um, the nice thing about the external scheduler is that it takes care of a lot of things for us. And now, since we are the one responsible of saying what piece of code runs when, this uh, falls on us. And there are a couple of uh, specific problems that we have to be aware of it of them. Uh, one of them is that blocking operations are blocking. So this is obviously true if we're using uh, threads as well, but if we have a process that is made of entirely of coroutines and one coroutine is calling a blocking operation, then the entire process is blocked, not just that coroutine specifically, as opposed to a thread where it might not be a great idea for me to block the thread at all, but at least the other threads can still run. The uh, external uh, scheduler will give them, will allocate time for them. Uh, and, and this some, is something that you should be very careful, especially when you're using a sort of a third party or external libraries that do any action. Uh, they may do uh, a blocking operation, assuming that you know they're run in some thread where it's okay to, uh, to block the operation. So that's, uh, uh, that's one problem. Uh, the other is uh, coroutines that simply won't yield. Uh, they can be either busy wait, or maybe they are genuinely working hard on you know, calculating cryptocurrency or whatever. But if they don't yield, there is nobody outside that will force them to relinquish the, uh, the CPU core for other coroutines to work with. So those are, are, are certain limitations and uh, they're not too bad, frankly. Uh, it, those are things that, you know, good libraries, good facilities could greatly reduce the, the difficulties. I'm going to, the last part, show how, for example, we, we uh, dealt with it. Um, so it's an issue, you should be aware of it. Those are limitations. But uh, they, they're not that bad, I think. Uh, the last one though, the no multi-core support, that one hurts. Uh, and since we are the only one uh, that can switch stacks with coroutines, the scheduler can only give us one core at a time. And that is of course a huge waste 
uh, for a modern uh, hardware. So what can you do with that? Well, there are a couple of possible solutions. Uh, one is to combine coating with threads. So uh, in this setups, you have several work threads, uh, roughly one per CPU that you want to utilize. Uh, each thread runs a coating until it yields, and then starts to execute a different coating. So the, we have a, this sort of uh, repository of coatings, and each thread can take a coating from the pool, execute it until it yields, and then it returns it to the pool and takes another coating instead. So in this case, we lose some of the benefits, but not all of them. Since we do have real parallelism going on, we have several thread running, we still need the locks, we still get all the race conditions and deadlocks and all those issues come back, but we have a better control on resources. Not everybody starts their own threads. We have a fixed pool of threads and uh, uh, we only use uh, uh, that, that amount of resources. Switching between tasks is still a little bit cheaper and uh, we can uh, control priorities if we think about the, we can decide what logic the threads pull the coatings from the repository so we can also create some sort of prioritization between what tasks do we think is import are important and which ones are less so. This is one solution. Uh, I've seen this going a lot. This is what uh, Go, for example, does by default. They raise uh, threads as the number of CPUs and you generate coatings and uh, the coatings run on whichever thread is available. Uh, we actually decided to go a slightly different route. We just have several instances of the same process. So, uh, there is some overhead in doing that, obviously. There's some sections of code and memory that are duplicated between uh, each, uh, each process that otherwise uh, wouldn't have. But we keep all the benefits as well. We don't have blocks in our code. We have uh, several, I don't want to guess like something like 20, Concurrent, uh, oper uh, concurrent processes, concurrent executions, let's say, running, and we don't need locks. Think about it for a moment. That's not trivial. Um, if, uh, if we do need to share memory between processes, that can happen, uh, we can use shared memory. And then you can ask, well, doesn't that just returns the same problem that we originally had? because again, now we have a shared memory that can be accessed from several uh, places at the same time. And the answer is uh, sort of, but there is an inverse here. Instead of everything being shared, unless you somehow lock it, everything is not shared unless you specify that you want it to be shared. So you know exactly when and when data can be shared only when you walk with, the, with that shared memory. Uh, a random variable or a piece of memory in your program by default is not shared. This is the, this is saves you a lot of places where you uh, might look at something and uh, not realize that there are implications for other threads and that you need to lock it. Okay, so that's uh, that, that's about that. That, that is uh, the way that we go. It's slightly different than uh, I think what most people went with. Uh, let's go, uh, let's continue. So uh, having said that, let's look at C++ uh, 20. So I copied this uh, from uh, cppref.com. So, uh, what is what what the I highlighted the 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 key things I think here, uh, coating are stackless, 
there is uh, uh, there's data that is stored separately from the stack. And what's important is that allocates uh, a state when uh, it starts and it copies all the information into that state. Okay, that's a big that's a bit vague. Let's think about more for a moment what it means. What it means to be stackless. All the data that the function needs is stored outside of the stack. It's basically stored somewhere in the heap. So what it means is that it's not that we don't have a stack frame. We do have a stack frame. It just doesn't sit on the stack. It sits somewhere outside the stack on the heap. And, the, and that stack frame is alive so long as the coroutine is active. Once the coroutine stops being active, either we finished it or, uh, or we cleared the, the coroutine in some other way, we release the memory. But until then, there's a piece of memory on the heap that is effectively a stack frame that is reserved for that specific coroutine. And that, uh, and that holds all the internal variables that you would usually uh, associate with a, with, a, with a regular function. So let's look, let's go back and, and see what does the magic that we saw in the beginning actually costs us. So in this, uh, in this case, we start running, we uh, go and, and we decide to run in order on the top uh, uh, node here, number four. So we allocate uh, some frame stack for that. And then we go for number two, we allocate a stack for that. And then we go for number one and we allocate a stack for that. There is no, uh, nothing for further to go down to. So we release the stack for that and we go back for two and allocate a stack for three, release it, release the stack for two, go to go back to four, we allocate a stack for six, allocate for stack for five, release the stack for five, release the stack for six, release the stack for, uh, for four. So we, in total, we have uh, six allocations, memory allocations and releases uh, during this code. And at most at any given time, since the depth of the tree is uh, three level deep, at most three of them are alive and active at a given moment. So we should be aware that this is, that this is what's going to happen behind the scene when we're doing this. And, uh, okay, so I'm actually going to skip, uh, skip this and uh, go back uh, later on. So there are a couple of uh, things that we need to consider when we're doing this. We need to consider them, you know, in, in general, whenever we code in uh, C++, but here as well specifically. We have memory allocation here and calling coroutine can, for example, throw bad alloc. So that's not something that you would expect. Uh, just calling a, a function usually does not generate the exception in, in such a way. Um, you have caching issues. Uh, now the program needs to access some uh, section of the heap all the time. Uh, what is the object lifetime? That's also less than trivial in, in, in this section. So those are things that you need to consider uh, regardless of coroutines. And I hope that, you know, think about this as a stack frame that exists outside of the, of the stack and will help you uh, come to terms with those. So the last question is, uh, I started by giving you this nice talk about how coroutines is exactly like threads and you can stop anywhere and switch to another stack. And well, the, the question is, can you do that in C20? Um, the answer is not easily. The reason is that the C20 standard only allow one sort of stack frame to be allocated at a time. So only the coroutine itself uh, uh, will, uh, will allocate the stack, outside, will allocate a frame outside of the stack. 
and the return is always directly to the function or coroutine that we called from. This means that if, for example, I want to, uh, to call three functions and uh, then yield from the top level and not get all these pseudo stack rolled back, the, the, it's not something that is trivial to do. You can do that. I started working on that. It's possible. You need to wrap things around in various ways that are not very convenient, but it's not trivial for the very least. Uh, so most of the uses of coroutines as tasks I've seen actually uses the uh, the other approach. As I said, they allocate a pool of threads and they use the coroutines for lazy evaluation. So we have a pool of threads and a pool of uh, coroutines. And whenever a coroutine yields, uh, uh, a thread returns it to the, to the pool and takes another one instead. So what are the benefits? Uh, the benefits are that you can create the uh, the task in one place. It only runs if it needs to on another thread. Uh, what makes this easier to do than, you know, we could have done the, this without coroutines, but what makes it easier is that we actually have uh, uh, a stack frame that is not related to a specific stack. So we can move it from thread to thread from one stack to the, to another. Okay, so uh, this is sort of the uh, the overview, if you will, uh, before switching to the actual code uh, that we uh, code samples. Uh, do are there any questions? Yeah, there is a question in the chat by Avi. Uh, can you control the allocation uh, uh, pre-allocated arena? Uh, I believe so. For I believe so. Yes, uh, you can. Uh, the standard does allow uh, you to customize the new operator in a way that will allow that. So, so you can. Okay. So, so if there are no more questions, let's uh, skip right into the code. Uh, so we used coroutine too. They, they were developed by Oliver. I'm sorry, I tried. I really tried to pronounce the last name. Anyway, I tried. It didn't come out anywhere near what it should sound like. So I'll uh, I'll try not to embarrass anybody by saying it. Uh, it supports C++ uh, 11 and up, and it supports both symmetric and asymmetric uh, calling. We'll talk about that, what it means in a second. It's a first class object, so we can uh, save the coroutine, uh, pass it as a parameter for a function, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. And what's important for our sake, it supports a full stack. So full stack, so we don't just save the, uh, the first frame or the, the initial frame, we actually can save several stack frames together. Uh, this makes it a full stack support, which as I said in the beginning is what some people will call a fiber. Um, as to the difference between symmetric uh, and asymmetric uh, coatings, it really get, comes down to the question of uh, when I yield the, the execution, when I say, okay, give the execution to somebody else, to whom uh, does the execution go to? Uh, there is one way you can say, well, all coroutines are equal and each other coroutine is as likely as the next one to be executed. This is called a symmetric. And another approach is to say, uh, no, uh, we only return the execution back to the coroutine that originally called us. Um, so that's uh, symmetric and asymmetric. Uh, I would say, uh, Boost coroutine to does support symmetric uh, uh, invocation. So you can switch from every coroutine to any other coroutine. However, the interface does encourages you to use uh, asymmetric uh, invocation, I think. Um, 
So I'm not going to go very deep into uh, boost coding too. It's a fascinating and complicated uh, piece of code. Um, I'm going to mention that there are two major components to uh, to the code to this library. It's called uh, coroutine pull type and coroutine push type. They sort of work together with one another. Uh, pull uh, type uh, used to pass data from the coroutines. So uh, it, it's uh, a bit like uh, uh, out, uh, output iterator. The, uh, the constructor immediately starts the coating. So whenever you uh, create a pool, uh, a pool type coating, you implicitly uh, also pass the execution to that uh, coating. Uh, and the thing that I I'm less excited about in this, uh, uh, in this library is that what a pool type expects to get is some callable that uh, that takes as a, a single parameter the matching push type reference. We'll see that in a moment. It's not, I think, I don't, it's not trivial for me. And we have uh, the push type, which is similar to the pull type. It used to pass data to the coating, so it's an input iterator. Uh, the constructor doesn't start the routines automatically. And like uh, uh, like uh, the pool type, it expects uh, to get exactly callable that gets the pool type as reference as a single uh, variable. And the way you switch from uh, one coroutine to the other is simply by invoking the uh, uh, the pool type or the push type, depending on which direction you want to go. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to do is to define some sort of wrapper. So uh, I will get something that looks a little more like uh, what I would have liked to, to see. So I'm going to define a routine as a, as a function that takes no parameters and return no parameters. And what I'm going to do is Whenever that, uh, uh, whenever I get such a such a function, I'm going to create a push type uh, uh, coroutine, and I'm doing a bit of magic here with the invoke. So I want to uh, save the uh, pull type that I will get. So the return type. So so the reason why. Uh, the routine needs to get pull type by reference is that if I want to return from the current coroutine and return the execution uh, back to the original uh, coroutine that called me, I need to invoke pull. So that's why it's the only parameter that uh, is passed. In order to, uh, to avoid that and sort of hide that from the user, I'm going to save it to uh, uh, to uh, to uh, to unique PTR uh, here at the bottom. Uh, I should point, I, I've not said so, but I should point out that uh, both pull type and push types uh, are movable, but not copyable. So I need to move the, uh, and I'm going to save it in my wrapper. So whenever uh, anybody wants to say, well, uh, dear, uh, dear coroutine, please uh, yield. I will have easy access to the pool type from a location that I'm aware of. So when everybody, uh, when somebody says, okay, now it's your turn to run, uh, to execute. So they will call run and that just invokes the push type. Whenever somebody wants to say, well, now it's your turn to yield, just pull, just recall the pull type and return us back to the main, uh, 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 to the main thread. And uh, I'm going to be able to, and I want to ask whether the coding is finished, is it still active or not? So again, that's something that uh, I can just do by casting the routine uh, into a Boolean. And the interface, uh, I'm going to start with a very simple interface here. I want to be able to add a routine. 
say this is another routine that I want to, to be executed. I want to say that I want to yield and run and stop is just, you know, start, a, start a executing coroutines and stop executing coroutines for a moment. Um, okay. So let's, uh, let's summarize what we have right now. What we have is one main, uh, 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 one main coroutine, which would be the scheduler. And I just created, a, uh, just created a mechanism that will allow that scheduler to invoke every uh, invoke coroutines and get the execution back from the coroutines when they yield by some order that the scheduler chooses to do. So I'm basically uh, trying to create a poor man's uh, substitution for the scheduler in the kernel. The difference is, is that uh, since I since it's my program, I have more information than what the scheduler in the kernel usually does. I'm going to create a very simple scheduler, and then we are going to talk about how we can improve on that if we so choose. So, what does the scheduler needs to know? It needs to know uh, what are the coroutines that are currently exist in the system. So that's the uh, the map here. It needs to know which coroutine is currently active. It needs to know whether it's running right now. And uh, since I'm allocating the, uh, the uh, IDs for the coroutines, I need to know which, what is the next available ID for coroutines as well. Okay, okay. so uh, there are some very simple uh, uh, routines that we're going to have. If we want to add a routine, all we need to do is really just add it to the map of all existing routines. If we want to yield, then we have to check, first of all, if we're running. And if we're running, we can go to the active routine and just ask it to yield. And it will return the, uh, the execution back to the main uh, scheduler. If we stop, we just stop uh, the, uh, can just, stop, just mark the, the process stop. We may want to also yield the, the current coroutine, so we immediately return uh, to the main scheduler. So this is the sort of the interesting part. Uh, how do we run those coroutines? What the scheduler actually does? Well, this one uh, just does a very simple round robin. Uh, when I start the process, uh, I get uh, I start at the uh, beginning of the coroutines. As long as uh, nobody told me to stop and there are still coroutines available, I'm going to go to the current coroutine and ask it to run. When that coroutine will at some point call yield, I will return and then I'm going to ask, well, is the coroutine still active? If it is, we're just going to uh, progress to the next coroutines. If it's not active, then we're going to erase it from the, uh, uh, from the repository of, of coroutines. If we reach the end of the, of the repository, then we just go back to the beginning and continue again. So very simple round robin. Okay, is everybody still with me? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, excellent. So uh, let's look at an example of how this would look in, in an actual code. So uh, let's say I have a worker class and as part of the worker class, uh, I, I want to say, I reached a point where I want to send some information to the cloud, an actual use case that we have. Now I don't want to stop the entire execution of the code that I'm doing just to send things to the cloud. Uh, let's put it, we're going to put it on a separate task and let it execute sometimes on its own uh, time frame. So how does that look like? So I need to find, uh, I need to create a callable that accepts uh, no value and return no value. Well, that's easy using a Lambda. 
I'm going to pass to the Lambda the information that I actually want to send using the capture clause of the Lambda. And the actual call is just, in this case, loop over all the uh, strings that you want to, to send and send each and every one of them to the cloud. So I, I just created uh, some task that will run asynchronously at some point, depending on my scheduler. And uh, I continue uh, the execution of do something uh, without worrying about it. So this is how I, uh, I add routines. Let's look about, let's look at an example where I, where I want to yield. So let's say I now have a sender and the sender also after sending needs to read the reply that we get. So we don't want to put anything into a blocking mode, as we said. So what we're going to do, we are going to use, in this case, a pool. We can also use select and check whether the, uh, the socket that we are listening, that we're going to use is actually uh, open for reading. If it's not open for reading, uh, uh, we are going to yield. If it is, we can, we can stop waiting. So what's going on here? Basically, every time, uh, until such time that the socket becomes ready for reading, I just keep yielding. Just keep and say, okay, I, have, I, I can't execute right now. Give the execution to somebody else. Whenever the socket becomes uh, ready for writing, uh, the execution flow will go back to me and I will go, okay, now I can read. Then I can get out, get out of this while one loop and do act the actual reading and whatever else I need to do. And the, the thing to note here is that if ready reply was say called from somebody else who waits for get reply to continue its, the continue running, then the internal state of whoever called get, uh, read reply is also saved when we yield. So we save the entire call stack. Okay. Uh, is the example clear enough? Uh, but this is the example that I have. If anybody wants to ask any further question or- where, do do where does the actual read happen? Sorry, I didn't get you. I, I'm asking where, where does the read from the socket happen? Because you're yielding when there's nothing on the socket and you say, yeah, well, I'm not closed, but maybe sometime in the future, I'll, I'll have stuff to read. Yes. So. so so the, the use case that I, that I imagined here is that um, I've sent said, uh, an HTTP message to the cloud and I'm waiting, you know, to read the reply to say whether it's, uh, whether, you know, whether I get a 200 okay or some error code. So on the one hand, I want to read from a socket but I don't want to block until until the, I get a reply from the cloud. So okay, but the yield means that you're, you're not blocking when you're still waiting, but where does the actual work happen when you do get a reply? Oh, uh, do you see the, the three points uh, down here uh, after the while? So once the socket becomes a, a becomes active, I break outside of the while and I can read here. Okay, okay. I, I thought the while is for waiting for incremental data. So here you're assuming, maybe there's another while, but it's outside of this while. Yes, exactly. So I'm just doing the, I uh, just wanted to, uh, I wanted to scope it just on the, on the waiting element to emphasize okay. the, okay, okay. the that, issue. That was, that's what was missing from right here. So. Yeah. When you do get data, then you're not yielding. You're starting the process of actually reading the data. If it's a single byte, then you do it and you're done. If it's also incremental, then you can also yield while you're reading. Correct. Yes. Okay. And there would be like another while. Okay. 
that makes sense. Yes. How do you okay. handle if the socket is closed on you or something like that? Uh, so if the socket is closed, uh, then I will break out of the uh, out of the loop in this case, and I'll have to uh, when I try to read, I will get uh, an error that the socket is closed, and I need to handle that the same way I handle the usual errors. So the the first loop is only to tell you when you have something, and then you need to to check what some what that something is. That's uh, correct. Okay. Correct. Look, I tried specifically to scope it just on the waiting until uh, we are ready to take action. And, and of course, the, 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 the important thing is in, in an actual system is that all this is, so, sorry, all, all the section of the wall is sort of wrapped up, to, wrapped up for you in a convenient interface. So, you shouldn't care, you just do a uh, read and the infrastructure will do all the select or pull and yield if necessary and all of that. But when you're using this, let do you have an example that you show how to use the read reply? Because if you're looking for a full read, it's like, it's, a, it's the case that I can imagine is let's say you're trying to read several replies, then you're making progress, but if you're just waiting for one reply, then you're going to block anyway. So, uh, so, so that's going to be in the loop too. So uh, you can imagine that uh, read reply is just substitutes the usual read. So it just gives you how many bytes there are right now. So we just replace the the blocking read with a read that yields. So all the, uh, uh, so all the, uh, the logic that, that we're talking about, so what if not, there are not enough bytes ready? Well, that happens when you're using us the, the normal read function as well, correct? The normal uh, async, the, the non-blocking read, yeah. The blocking, let's say the, the blocking C call, C function. If I, if I were to write a very simple program, I would use read in a blocking mode, and then I will get some bytes, and if I still need more bytes, I, I will do read again. What I want to do is to replace that read with a read that yields. So I'm going to put the uh, this while in the beginning, and then I'm going to do the, the, the usual read, the usual blocking read, but I'm guaranteed that the, that the read that I do will return immediately because I checked that the uh, uh, that the socket is open for reading before calling it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So there's a question in the chat, and uh, I'll read it for you, and then we'll start wrapping up for the next uh, talk. So what is the difference between your code and Boost ACO uh, coroutines with the scheduler using IO context and spawn? Uh, that's a good I question. Uh, um, I'm not familiar with Boost uh, ISO enough to, to give a full answer to that. Uh, I'm going to, to talk about a bit uh, about the enhancement that we did, and maybe that will give uh, some of the answer. Uh, because we did we did uh, a bit more enhancements on top of that in the actual code, uh, which maybe you can do with the boost uh, ISO, but uh, uh, um, you, you, basically I haven't explored the the the, uh, the documentation of boost well enough to feel that I can give you a, a full and qualified answer to that. It, it's a big library. That's legit. Uh, I have two questions. One is, can uh, Paul can return minus one if I remember correctly. So if that's the case, then you break. Uh, yes, there, there is a general also question uh, I should point out of uh, handling exceptions. Uh, in general, what happens when a code in uh, throws an exception? Uh, I did not get into this in, the, in this example, but uh, Boost Code in 2 does have a support for that. Okay. 
Second uh, question that I have is it feels like you're implementing uh, non-blocking in a user mode. That's, that's my feeling at least. Yes. Your feeling is, uh, is quite correct. Okay. 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 So uh, let's look at some of the enhancements that we did. Uh, I didn't put all of it in, in the example to keep it short, but it's not very hard to uh, to extend. One of one one option is to have more metadata on your routine. Uh, I highly recommend you name your routines. It's incredibly useful for debugging when you know uh, that something happens if and instead of a uh, Routine five, you get the actual the name of the routine and what it was supposed to do. It's really helpful to understand what's going on. Uh, another thing that you can ask is to have a priority and say, this is a routine that's very important for me. Uh, whatever you do, please allocate time for that routine. Another routine might be less important and you can you know, be deferred until you have more resources or less uh, stress on the system. Uh, you can extend the interface. Uh, you can check simple things you can do. You can check if a routine is finished. You can uh, uh, stop the current or another routine. Uh, you can yield for a period of time. Uh, you can yield on. Uh, you can be yield based on how much time has passed since you start running. Uh, you can halt and resume routines. Uh, uh, you can uh, yield that the routine has finished uh, till some other routines have finished running. Uh, all of those things are not very difficult to, to implement. Uh, you can have more types of routines. So I just created a routine that just run to completion, but you can ask to have a, a recurring routine, something that you know happens every minute, five minutes, 10 minutes, 30 seconds, just gives the function and make sure it runs every so often. You can have a routine that listens to a signal, so it waits until some sort of a file descriptor becomes uh, open to reading and then read the data. For example, if I'm going to uh, implement a sort of a server, then I want to listen on the, uh, on the incoming socket and only invoke the routine when, the socket, when so there's something on the socket for me to do. Uh, on the scheduler, uh, since we have priority, we can have priority queues. We can change how priorities are allocated dynamically. If there is a stress on the machine right now, maybe I want to stop all the uh, all the low priority tasks and only give the high priority tasks ta uh, time to to allocate. Uh, we can be time aware, so we can we can't force a routine to stop, but we can you know at least measure how much they they are they they, they run maybe some sort of mechanism that allows to ask them to yield if too much time has gone by. Uh, the current scheduler that we implemented right now uh, does busy wait. We can avoid busy wait. Uh, if we see that all the routines returns immediately, we can, you know, just wait or, or, or detect that and don't start running them immediately right after. And and lastly, and this is also uh, quite important, it's very easy to get a telemetry and see which tasks take how much time uh, on your process, because you have now a scheduler of your own that can measure the, all the information that you care about and give you the information back. Uh, so those are, are sort of enhancements over this uh, solution that I, I presented that we implemented. And, uh, the thing is, as, as I said earlier, uh, great power and great responsibility. Uh, you can uh, uh, customize uh, the scheduler to, to match your specific requirements. And uh, it's not that hard. It, it's scarier than it's, uh, it sounds scarier than it is. Uh, but uh, you can get actually very good results. And I think it, overall it was worth it for us. So. Uh, Consider, uh, consider that as well. Um, so first of all, thank you for listening and for uh, showing up for this uh, talk. And uh, if, uh, is there any more questions? Uh, I'll be happy to try and answer them.